today we want to start off with a homework problem. This is from the chapter three homework and where we're talking about linear functions. And so what we have here is uh, you were given some data. So the data is birth rates as a, a percentage of birth outside of marriage and the year since 1990. So the questions are going to be, how do we view this, this data, this information in multiple ways? One of those ways is going to be a graph. How do we visualize the information? And the, another way that we want to look at this information is to uh, create an equation. How do we make um, an algebraic relationship between the input and the output? So those will be the three different ways that we want to describe what's going on here. So some overall things. What we're doing is we're measuring something against time. So anytime we're trying to look at a trend over time, our time is going to be our, should go on the horizontal axis. This is just how we normally read things. Normally, when we're measuring, when we're studying something over time, time goes on the horizontal axis. Normally, it doesn't have to. And it could be that both axes are time. Like, let's make a graph of the, world record in the um, 100 meter dash over time. So it's gonna be time and then time. But the thing that we're measuring goes on the, hor the vertical axis and over the time that we're measuring over goes on the horizontal axis. So usually we put time on the horizontal axis. Usually we put time on the horizontal axis. And so that's why I want to put down here years since 1990. On our horizontal axis. I don't know if the problem decides what the variable should be. Let P be the percentage of births. So P at T years since 1990. So this is going to be where we put T and then our vertical axis will be P. So the vertical axis is going to be percent, percentage of births outside marriage. So um, that would be the first part. Uh, the variable, so this is uh, it's because it's a computer problem, it's it's a multiple choice. So T should be represented on the horizontal axis and P should be on the vertical axis because the number of years after 1990 explains the percentage of births outside marriage. So it's important to recognize that the explains part is kind of how we're trying to determine this. So when, when in, in this book, um, when we say so one thing explains the other, we're just saying we're the, hor the quantity that we put on the horizontal axis is explaining what's going on on the vertical axis. So that's, why, that's how the word explains that's how we interpret the word explains in this context. We're taking, um, we're saying, we're mapping something over time. So we're using time to explain the percentage of births outside of marriage. From a mathematical standpoint, that's what we're going for. From a sociological standpoint, that would be completely different. That is not what we mean. That's not the context. But like we've talked about before, um, your audience matters and context matters. So, that's what we mean in this context for this audience. So as far as units displayed on the axis, the, the inputs that we have down here are not years. We want the years since 1990, because T is the number of years since 1990. So in 1990, that's when T is equal to zero. So 1990 corresponds to T equals zero. 1995 would be T equals five. 
2000 is T equals 10. So usually when we're measuring something in over years, we pick a zero year. We always wanna pick a zero year because we don't want the, the T equals zero to represent year zero. Mostly because we don't have that information. I don't know what percentage of births occurred outside of marriage in the year zero. So we don't wanna have to plug in things like 19, uh, 1,990 just to make our function work. If we're, all, if we're always gonna be plugging things near, starting with 1990, then we make that year zero. So that's why we want to make sure that we label years since 1990 on our horizontal axis. And then percentage of births outside marriage, that's what we're trying to uh, make a graph for on the vertical axis. So years since 1990 on the horizontal, percentage of births outside on the vertical. So now we have to come up with some kind of scale on either on each axis. So we notice that the years that we have are from 1990 to 2013. So 2013, we look at the values of T. And our scale goes for, starts off at zero in 1990 and goes up to 23 for, to represent 2013. So we look at this, the, the choices and one scales from zero up to 24 by twos. And it says for the, both the horizontal and the vertical, that's not gonna work because our percentage of births outside marriage goes from, ranges from 28 to 40, uh, well, 40.8 or 40.8. Uh, 40 so we need a higher, a bigger scale on the vertical axis. But uh, two through 24 would be a good choice for the horizontal. And then we look at the other ones. Uh, that was choice B on my list of things. Uh, in choice C, 26 to, to 44 on the horizontal, that's not what we want. And zero to 24 on the vertical. We want zero to 24 on the horizontal because that's the time. And then there's the last one uh, from 10 to 100. That's not what we want, that goes too far on the horizontal. That's from year 2000 to 2100. That's not where we're measuring things. So I think the best choice is gonna be go from zero to 24 on the horizontal axis. And then from 26 to 44 can be used for the vertical axis. It's a little bit, it, that's what's appropriate for this particular set of information. It's a little bit less misleading. If you just look at the chunk of your graph at, modeling the, have, with the data that you have in hand. So leaving off the zero to 26 part of your graph is going to make things seem, look, steeper than they actually are. So if we just go from 26 to 44 and just kind of like have those little two lightning bolts and cut off a big empty space of the graph, it takes a line that looks kind of flat, takes a line that is probably relatively flat and skews it up this way. This is something that we always need to watch out for because as soon as I see people cutting off big chunks of the graph, I assume they're trying to make things look steeper and I assume that they have an agenda that they're trying to push. So I start looking at the person that's giving me this data and saying, and start wondering, do they, does, does this person have an agenda to push? Because by cutting off a lot of cutting off a big um, a big piece of your graph, it takes something that's relatively flat. Say something went from uh, seventy to seventy five. So from seventy to seventy five, and we want to make that look more dramatic. Instead of going from seventy to seventy five on a zero to one hundred scale. I'll go from 70 to 75 on a 70 to 75 scale. And that takes something that looks kind of flat and says, whoa, look how dramatic it is. Look how steep that line is. And really it was just a change to seven, from seven to 75. And that's not as big a deal as the graph. We're attempting to make it look with the graph. So always be wary about 
people handing you graphs. So when they give you a picture, so we wanna list the T values from zero to 24 by twos. So when we wanna do that, we wanna go from T equals zero to T equals 24 by twos. That is zero, two, four, six, all the way up to 24. So the way we can it, encode this into um, in, in our graph, but when you're looking at the graphs down below, we would say this axis goes, starts off at zero and ends at 24 and goes by two. So here's the start, the X, the minimum, here's the max, and here's the scale. So we're listing three separate things, the minimum, the maximum, and the scale. So the scale is just where we're gonna put in little marks. So it's two, four, six, eight, ten, 10, and so on. On the p-axis, we wanna go from, uh, our choices are from 26 to 44, and we wanna go from 26 to 44 by two. So we would do th the same thing. So p-axis, from P equals 26 to P equals 44 uh, by twos. And so I would summarize that, just kind of encode that information by saying, go from 26 to 44 with a scale of two. And that's the notation that we use in this particular textbook. That's a little bit of a local notation. Here's the reason that we want to use this local notation. This notation is designed for this particular machine. Oops, the machine didn't come with. This notation is designed for this particular machine. So what we're doing, let's see, get rid of my trig stuff, is we wanted to set, we're trying to set the window. We're telling the, gra the calculator where to look. So on the X, on the horizontal, I wanna start off at zero and I wanna to go to a max of 24 and I wanna scale of two. And then the Y's, I'm gonna go from 26 to 44 on a scale of two. So there's the X min, there's the max, and then there's the scale. I don't think I have, oh, I wanna get rid of my, I had a super slow function in there, so it would have taken a long time just to put this together. So this has no data on it. What we want to do is we want to enter in the data that we have in the table. So to do that, oops, I'm not needing my T values. To do that, um, if we go into the stack button, this will allow us to ed edit our lists. So the table that we're trying to build, oh, can I just do it here? Oh, here we go. If we just go into the table, we can start entering in our data, zero, 1990, 95, 2000, 2005, uh, 2020, and 2013. Oh, nope. How did I have my table set? There we go. So in my table setup, um, I want my independent, I wanna be able to enter in values into the table button. So I have to switch my table setup, so second window, so that when I go into the table, second table, I can put in the X's, oh, jerk. I'm glad this is getting recorded as I sit here and try to remember how the calculator works. Oh, 
All right. Let me take a different tack. All right, reset. It's not letting me do what I thought, what I wanted it to do. Let's go into the stat button. And let's put in our data in list one and list two. So we're gonna do the same thing, zero, five, 10, 15, 20, and 23. So in the stat button, stat button, you wanna edit. And then you're gonna put in L1, we'll put in all of our uh, years since 1990. Then in L2, we'll put in all the other data. So the percentage of births outside of marriage. So I'll start out with the 28.0, 32.2, 33 33.2, 36.9, 40.8, and 40.6. So let's start off by entering the data. Now, when we go to the graph, if we go to the graph where we had set the window, we don't see anything. It's like, well, hey man, where are all my points? We have to go into the, um, we have to go into the Y equals and we have to go and highlight our plots. Because what we want is we want to go into stat plots and we want to make sure that plot one is on. So plot one is going to be um, list one, list two, and it's gonna, oh, oh, and it's blue. That's the new thing we get with the color edition. Now with plot one on set to be list one and list two, when I go to my graph, I can see where the points are. And then we can see all these, the, uh, all the different jumps that we have. Here we are at 28. There's a big increase up to 32.2. .2, so that's a 4.2 increase. But then from 1995 to 2000, there was only a 1% increase, sorry, one percentage point increase. And then from 2000 to 2005, we see a bigger jump. And then we see another jump from the, a similar jump from 36.9 to 40.8, and then actually a decrease to 40.6. So it's kind of like increase and then it's kind of flattened out and it increased steadily over these 10 years and then it's kind of leveled off. Generally, the line is going up. So if I use a very fat line, this is kind of the trend. And this is what we're trying to do. What's the equation of this trend? Any questions on the concept? So once again, those are the settings that we want to put in to make this get the scatter plot. So I'm actually recording today. I forgot last time, but I'm actually recording today. So you can just check out the video and pause in the relevant sections to see what the settings need to be. Now, what we want to do is write an equation for the percentage of births outside of marriage in terms of years since 1990. To do that, we want to stat calculate when we want to take a bunch of data and find the equation of a line, what we're doing is called a linear regression. So let's do a linear regression of the form AX plus B. And the default is list one as the X and list two as the Y. And that's what we want. So we just start hitting enter until we get to calculate. And it tells us the equation of the line. The slope is 0.5644. That's five, six, four, five. And the y-intercept is 28.41. So we're describing this equation of the line as P is uh, 28.4 plus 0 0.564 times T. So this is the linear, this is the regression line. So 
When we do a linear regression, we're taking all the points, all six points into account and putting them together to try to find a line that best fits the data. There are rules that we have because it's a math class. There are rules that we have for what qualifies as the line that fits the best. But it involves all six points and not just two, any two of the points. Any two of the points is not going to give us a great description because it's going to be leaving off some information. So if I put in the graph, if I put in a 28.4 plus 0.564 times x, we see that this is a pretty good description. It's the best overall description. It looks like it hits one point exactly, but we can see that if we, if we try to use, say these three points that were on a line, it's a little bit too steep and the, I don't have a thinner line, and the y-intercept would come out a little bit too low. But if I use these two points, I would get information that's just going the wrong direction. If I use these two points, it would look a little bit too flat. So what we want to do is come up with a system that will give us, that will take all the data into account and draw a line that fits the best. I'm not totally sure that this is what the problem was intending for you to do, but since it's come up, that I think it, uh, it looks like based on the, the answers, the selection of answers they have, I think they intended for you to do a linear regression on this. Now this is a linear regression performed on a calculator. You can also do linear regressions on spreadsheets like Google Sheets um, that you have access to if you just open up Google Sheets. That's a, a web thing. It's like Excel, but uh, just everywhere. Um, or if you have Excel, that will also do um, that will also do a linear regression for you. And although I don't remember how to do it, I, I barely remember how to do it on the calculator. Um, the Desmo, Desmos.com is a web-based graphing calculator that you can also do linear regressions on. But one of the reasons that your the questions that you come across in in the chapter three are so specific about where should we put in our, where should we put the T axis? Where should we look at the P axis? The reason that those questions come up so much and that they're so focused on what scale, what range should we use and what scale should we use is that um, uh, the reason that is because they're working from the perspective that everybody is going to be doing this on a TI-84. And so with that in mind, they want to focus on getting the rain, the window in the right spots. So all those questions like, oh, what range should we use? Where should we look? X min is the left, X max is the right, X scale is where we put marks. Y min is the bottom, Y max is the top, Y scale is where we put the marks. Oh, it even tells you distance between tick marks on X axis. Oh, it doesn't tell you about the Y max though. Oh, and it doesn't tell us what, I've never known what X res does. Someone happens to know what X res, what this number does, and you, and you can tell me, then put that in the comments of this video when it shows up on YouTube. Not that anybody watches these on YouTube. You know what I mean? So, um, it looks like what that, that particular problem was asking you to do was to take all this data and perform a linear regression. This is because the data was not well behaved. It wasn't just strictly linear to begin with. We're using a line to approximate what's going on because it's not increasing by the same amount. We haven't, uh, talking about linear equations is the, in the second half when we start looking at trends and start building models of things that we see. A linear model is based on a pattern of repeated addition. So just as a DVD bonus material, linear models represent patterns of repeated of addition, of repeated addition.
Linear models are for patterns of repeated addition. And so if I have a table of values of X and Y, um, if we happen to have, let's, let's just come up with some random points, 0, 12. And let's suppose that next is going to be um, 5. And let's subtract 3 a bunch of times. 12 minus 3, no, not 3. Let's subtract 4. Yeah, it's fine. Subtract 4. So 12 minus 4 is 8. And then at 10, we'll subtract 4 again. And then at 12, we'll subtract 4 again. And then at, at oops, not 12, at 15. And then at 20, we'll subtract 4 again. So the repeated addition is happening in the y down here. So here's what makes this a linear function. We're subtracting 4 a bunch of times. Here's the repeated addition. This is what's making this a linear function. Because we are subtracting four at regular intervals. So notice that my x is always following the add five. So what we're doing is we're subtracting four every five units. It's a pattern of repeated addition. So if we think about linear functions in the case of, in terms of y equals mx plus b, if you're all about y equals mx plus b, this subtract four, this is the rise, and this plus five is the run. And so our slope, slope is rise over run, change in y, divided by change in x. And in this case, that would be decrease by four every five units. So negative four fifths. Then we just need a place to start. So our equation, y, will start off at, at 12. y is 12 when x is 0. And we'll subtract 4 every 5 units. And so the repeated addition shows up as multiplication. So y is 12 minus 4 fifths times x, because we're subtracting 4 fifths whenever x increases by 1. We're subtracting 4 fifths a bunch of times. Repeated addition is multiplication. So we're, uh, when we're subtracting four every five units, because it's a linear function, I can summarize that as minus four fifths every one unit. But it might be more useful to say, as an alternate form, y starts off at 12, and we subtract four a bunch of times. We subtract four every time it, x is a full multiple of five. So x we should read this as x divided by 5. Because the expression x divided by 5 will count by 5. So when x is 5, we have 1. When x is 10, we have 2. When x is uh, 15, we have 3. So when we say 12 minus 4 times the quotient of x and 5, 12 minus 4 this many times, x over 5 times. And so this is how we count by 5. This would be a crazy way to write linear functions, especially because we've been writing linear functions as y equals mx plus b for so long that it just becomes ingrained in us. But if I'm playing the list of things we got wrong in teaching math and that I wish we could change now, this would be one of them. Instead of summarizing the slope as rise over run, 
point out that we get to do that because subtracting four every five units is the same as subtracting four fifths every one unit. Also on that list in trigonometry, I would rather we use tau. We, the, instead of pi, we should have the ratio, instead of the ratio of the circumference to the diameter, we should have had the ratio of the circumference to the radius, in which case, instead of pi being 3.14, we'd have whatever we call it. The common name these days is tau. That's our big regret. Uh, it would have been 6.28, but it would have made a lot more sense. When you get into trigonometry, you'll know what I'm talking about. The other things, thing is, I wish we didn't use base 10. I wish we had started with base 12, but uh, these are things we can't go back and change. You know what I mean? Usually I'm against continuing to do something because that's the way we've always done. But sometimes that is the answer. We should continue to use base 10 because it would be absolutely awful to try to change now. We should continue to drive on the right side of the road because if we switch to the left, too many people would just die. So there are better ways to get around the fact that sometimes some places drive on the other side of the road. And that's just to let those places drive on the other side of the road. That would be a terrible thing to try to standardize because none of, none of those things really have any effect on our ability to be free citizens. You know what I mean? But like uh, voting rules, th those need to change. We don't get to have like different rules for different sets of people. And you can't, you, and the explanation is like, oh, well, it's, we've always just done it this way. That's not good enough. Because we've always done it this way. We mean it's like most of the people in the room right now don't get to vote. You know what I mean? So anyway, what are we talking about? Ah, yes. So um, that's what what math. Math connects to too many things, I guess. So um, that's what the intention was on the chapter three problem. Um, take a look at the video. That's how you can do a linear regression on the TI-84. You might have to pause because I I think there are some definite places where I that are definitely pausable where you can see which buttons I pushed and how to enter in the data and then how to run a linear regression on your calculating machine. That's not something that I would ask that you do like in the middle of a timed test where you can't look things up, but it is something that you should be aware of. And the big picture is it's a way to take six points and try to make one line that's best describes them all. Where all the points are a little bit off, but um, we've negotiated the that the the overall benefit is 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 best. The distance between any two couple of points is uh, the 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 difference between any point and the line. Actually, it's the sum of the squared differences. But it's it's like it's like any kind of negotiation. All the points can be off the line. That's okay. Just like in any kind of negotiation, if both sides walk out unhappy then it was probably a, a good negotiation. And that's probably as, as good as we're going to get. All the points are a little bit unhappy, but we've minimized that unhappiness. All right. So next week, we will be solving equations. And so setting up for next week, we're going to, this is going to be based on reading the expression and then we'll do inverse operations in reverse order. That's going to be the game we play next week. Inverse operations in reverse order. Read the expression, then do inverse operations in reverse order. All right, that's going to do it for today. Y'all have a nice weekend. I'll see you on Monday and thanks for playing.